Good morning, everybody. My name is Jen Adams, and uh, I have the pleasure this morning of interviewing Gary Hickman, the author of The Light Reapers, and Corey Michaels, who has narrated it uh, as it is now just coming out as an audiobook. Uh, it came out in April, and it is available through all of the usual channels. Um, and so I'm very excited to talk about the book. Um, we just I've been talking about the fact that, that you started writing the book in December and then released it in April, which had occurred to me was a very, very short amount of time from beginning of writing to end uh, as somebody who has tried to, to write before. Um, and, uh, and I imagine that that would probably have a lot to do with the fact that that's so much of this book was pulled from personal experience. Correct. Correct. Yes. Yeah, so I don't want to seem like I'm, you know, this, this writing, you know, guru, they could just, you know, pull stuff out of the air. It was definitely <laughs> stuff that I experienced. And so a lot of this stuff has been kind of sitting in my head. It was just a point of getting it down on paper and actually having, having it make uh, sense. So. Right, right. So, so when you began writing the book, were you looking at what had been going on in the news sometime around the end of the year? And was that something that informed uh, the premise for the book? Uh, because it, it was released in April and right in the middle of a pandemic. And that really is so much of what's going on in the book. That was, that was some of it. Cause, um, so I work in, uh, I'm a contractor for the government. So I do have certain news outlets, if you will, that, um, that I'm privy to. And so a lot of this stuff, you know, uh, as it was coming to fruition, as far as this, you know, the COVID-19 stuff coming to fruition as far as how it was progressing across the country. Um, it, 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 yeah, it did, it did inspire me to say, you know what, let's, um, cause I, I do like the, the zombie genre and stuff, but I didn't want to do the, the whole shambling, you know, mindless zombie. So I figured, you know, with the COVID-19 and just having like a little bit of a twist to it, just have it may infect people and just kind of make them like mindless killing machines. And, um, so yeah, I guess it's, uh, you know, I guess serendipity or serendipitous, if you will, that this was happening, the stuff was in my head, and just like perfect storm. And I said, let's just put it on paper and see what happens. Okay, and, and are you working on a sequel for the book or do you have some other books in development that, uh, that you're excited about? I am working on a sequel um, and I won't give any stuff away, but based on the ending of the first book, um, the, uh, would say the reception's been great, but the push to uh, continue and to add on to the story has been um, uh, pretty extreme. <laughs> I've gotten a lot of emails. They're like, "Come on, when's the when's the next book? I gotta you know see what's going on." So yeah, well, I've gotten he, probably about half of it done. Yeah, so. yeah, you better get to writing there, Gary, because I think that was my first uh, email after we were done. Uh, when I was done with the narration was, it's all done, and what the heck happens? <laughs> so, so uh, I, and I, I, haven't, I haven't made it to the end of your book, so I, I thank you for letting me know there's a cliffhanger. Um, uh, and Corey and I uh, have known each other for, for quite some time, and, and as uh, I'm sure anybody watching can see, he is the professional talker, uh, just from the background, since he's in an actual studio, and the other two of us are just trying to hide our clutter. Uh, yes. <laughs> so, <laughs> exactly. Um, but I, uh, uh, and I, I'm going to let you two go off on this, but, but I, I know what a big fan of the zombie genre and the horror genre Corey already is. So I can imagine that when you were looking for uh, an audio narrator for the book, that this might have been an area where the two of you hit it off. Well, it, it's funny. It, it came in a little bit different fashion than normal, uh, rather than me uh, seeking out and, uh, and doing the audition for the book. Uh, Gary had done his due diligence and went through and uh, being at which I applauded any author that goes through and, and starts listening to different uh, narrators and say, okay, this person, yeah, I could hear them doing it. And I could kind of hear this person doing it and sent uh, myself and, and several others uh, a note offering to uh, audition for it. I did. And I got to be the one blessed with uh, being able to record it, which even when I did the audition, I didn't really know that it, we were going to get that 
kind of new spin on the zombie genre because based on the audition piece, I, I still didn't know. I knew there was a virus uh, involved, uh, which was very interesting, again, d- considering the time that that was. I think it was end of April, I think, when Gary had, had sent that out for auditions. And so as I was reading it, yeah, I was uh, I was totally into it in the uh, without giving away too much the new spin on uh, on something that has been done so much. But yeah, I I do love the zombie genre. Yeah, and and what is it? Um, because I mean, I'm definitely guilty of having a Fangoria subscription as a teenager, uh, so I'm right right in there with you. Uh, what is it that you think really appeals to people uh, about horror? and about uh, uh, putting themselves in that state of, of, you know, being scared. I think sometimes even some people kind of, I guess it transcends, or they put themselves in a story, especially when somebody um, who you consider has it coming, gets it, and gets it in kind of a violent (laughs) fashion. I think some people can project themselves, you know, like rather than uh, just having a rough life or been bullied or whatever it may be, you know, at that time. I think they like to say, you know, when you, when you get the, a lot of times you get the, you know, antagonist or whatever and, you know, the villain and they get, you know, whacked in a very violent manner and it kind of makes them, I mean, probably morbidly, but I'm guilty of that. Kind of makes them feel good when, um, you know, they get just, not just get put in jail or get killed, but just, you know, get some get of the, the pain that they've inflicted, you know, put on them and I think people like that. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm right there with you. I was actually thinking about uh, when uh, Ramsey Bolton um, was eaten by his own dogs in Game of Thrones. I was like, yes! <laughs> <laughs> Which normally is not something I would cheer on, but boy, did he have it coming. So I, I absolutely relate to that. <laughs> Um, so, uh, I, I'd love to know about, uh, your, your character development. Um, I, I can only assume because of your special forces background that, that some of the characters are based on ac- actual people. Uh, uh, how do you, um, pick the characters that you do and then, uh, flesh them out? Um, especially for our kind of up and coming writers that might be watching this. So, yeah, um, there are a few of them that are, that are actually real people. Um, changed the names, of course, and these were more in with the um, security contractor piece because um, we did a lot of the, I guess, the dirty work, if you want to put it that way. And um, so, uh, so Abara, Abara is re- is real. He's a real guy. Um, Priest is a real guy, and um, I don't know. I, I don't want. I don't want to ruin it for people um, who have not read the book, but. See if once you read it, if priest isn't fam- if doesn't seem familiar to you. Um, oh. So he's one of the big ones. And um, Marcus Webb, the commander, he is a real guy as well. Um, black guy and um, was just he was just a great, great, great leader. And um, and that part of the book is is real. Where I just you know I'm not giving anything away, but how he was with like other units and they really didn't respect him and everything. He was kind of young and I guess, you know, being, um, I guess black, they didn't, I don't know. I don't know if that was an issue, but when he came to our unit and um, I just had, you know, I I sat down with him for, was it 15 minutes and already knew that this guy had it together. And I was like, you know what, you know, I'll follow this guy. And um, so, yeah, so a lot of them are real. And the char- as far as the character development, I wanted to spread it out to have people of like different backgrounds and different, um, um, you know, upbringing. So their reactions, I can, their reactions are different. And, um, you know, there is the, uh, the comedian of the group, um, which will be Doc, which once you read the, the book, you'll understand Doc is a goofball and um, everything. So, and as far as character development, I think it's really, really important um, because if the people, if people, the readers don't really relate to the characters, to me, the story just doesn't, it doesn't float. It doesn't really pan out because then they're not believing the people within the story. So then the story kind of, you know, kind of falls uh, short. 
Well, now, Corey, uh, tell me what it was like to, to read for all of these characters, because essentially as the, the narrator of the audiobook, you were playing everyone. Were there, were there any characters you really related to or ones that were kind of an uncomfortable fit almost? Or Well, it's, you know, it, it's funny because there's a, a fine line between narrating an audiobook, and I've uh, narrated many. Uh, this being, and not because we're talking about it right now, I'm not sucking up to Gary. I've already finished the book. I got the job. Uh, it was the the most fun I've had of any of my uh, audiobook narrations. So, which I love because that makes my job a lot easier if I'm enjoying it. Um, but there's a fine line between narrating an audiobook and trying to do uh, like radio theater. You know, it's not. It, the, but you want to be able to have that personality of each character, and that can be uh, that that can be ch challenging. I mean, there uh, with um, especially with female characters, because in case you didn't know, I'm not female, and no. <laughs> um, and my voice <laughs> doesn't really lend itself all that well. So all you can do, rather than trying to all of a sudden wear underwear too tight and go into a falsetto, is just to, you know, soften your voice a little bit to denote that you're you're doing a softer, a female character. And when I say softer, I just mean you know, the, the vocally. And, but then when you start getting a whole bunch of females, I run out of softer uh, tones to use. <laughs> so again, I don't want to give away too much, but there got a point where I'm like, okay, I'm running, I'm running out of ways to do a, do a female here. Um, but you know, some of the accents, you know, you, you don't want to, uh, it, you don't want to try and overdo it, but you want to try and bring that in. I think I had challenges with a couple of the characters. Um, hopefully I, I did o okay for, <laughs> for Gary. Uh, and then there were some that was really fun, like uh, Doc, who, you know, bottom line, uh, Doc's from the Bronx, you know, and he got, uh, he got the Brooklyn accent. And he's, he's just not right in the head. Uh, but he was awesome. I, I love Doc. And, you know, so Priest seemed uh, kind of like the uh, the grizzly, you know, vet of the group. He had been around. He's kind of, he's the oldest of the the group. And so I just kind of brought his down to, you know, more of a, a you know, kind of a gravelly lower tone. Um, and whereas uh, Webb, the, uh, the leader of the group, uh, him, I just really used my own voice. And so I went from kind of the lower narrator voice to just my regular voice for, for Webb. Um, you know, and so you just kind of got to have fun with it. I had a, I know I butchered the Puerto Rican accent for, <laughs> uh, for Pora Barra. I think I was all over the place, but I had a lot of fun with it. It was good. And, and so we had, we had, I, I had had a really, really good time with it. That's so awesome. Uh, and, and it's, it's really interesting to just hear you just very subtly change your voice. Um, I don't think people are really, really aware of how much goes into just those little changes. And especially when you have an entire book that you have to read, uh, where, where, like you said, you aren't going uh, so over the top with the female voices, but just enough of a subtle change that, that people in their minds can change as well. So, um, Gary, uh, I'm sure there are um, aspiring authors out there that are listening. Uh, is there any advice uh, or anything that you wish you would have known before you started the book um, or, or anything that, that you want to share that you think would be something inspirational for, for people that are uh, just starting or thinking about starting to, to write their first book? Um, yeah, I mean, I wish I would have started earlier. <laughs> I mean, just, just because, so when you, the problem I had, and I don't know if a lot of authors, when I thought about doing a book, the problem is I thought about the book, you know, the book, and you get uh, in your own head and it's just like, it just seems like such a monumental task. And the way I just, you know, calm down and, you know, and thought about it, the way I do it is I do it's kind of like building a house. I make the foundation. So I get like, you know, the characters and, um, you know, kind of do the main parts of the story. So I have like milestones as far as the story is concerned. I get that laid out. And then 
I go back and say, okay, so how do they get from A to B, you know, the transition? So then I do that. And then I, you know, once you get like, say for me, it gets from like, say B to C or so, you know, and they'll say, okay, this character, I need to, I need to let them know a little bit more about that. So I'll go back and then fill in the gaps, if you will. And that's, that's the way I do it. And I think if, if, you know, authors that are starting, if, if they don't try to think about the book, and they just think about the pieces going into the book. And um, I think they'll, it'll come easier to them. And I'm one of these people, just real quick. So I can't go, I just can't sit down at a computer and type and just, and write. It does not work for me at all. I've tried it multiple times. I actually have to go old school and I have a, just a notebook and a pen and I just start writing and it stuff just comes out. And then I did, then I have an editor, um, which is uh, Jennifer Rao. If people saw it in the book, or her name's in the book. She took my hieroglyphics and actually put it down <laughs> to written, uh, written words. And then um, ah, the unsung hero. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, my wife, Wendy, who's a school teacher, uh, she came and edited, you know, edited all the the the, 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 the uh, what do you call it, the mechanics and grammar and stuff. And it was bleeding to death when she had that red pen all over it. And, um, <laughs> but we worked together and we got it together. So the a long period really was the editing. It just, you know. It, it took a while to get the editing done. So, um, but there you go. And can I say just one thing about um, like the narration? Um, so when I was doing the, the book and I said, I absolutely positively want to have it be a, you know, a book narrator, you know, want to be, have it narrated. And I'm like, I don't want to do my own book because it just, I don't know, just weirded me out. So I actually went and like Corey said, I went and did my research and there was a, a total, I think about eight eight narrators that I reached out to and I sent a personal message to and I said, you know, would you please, um, you know, audition and you know, just let me hear the words and stuff. And there were some guys in there that I would say probably, there was a couple guys that were, I would say probably more polished than Corey, but the polishing made it too, I don't know, canned or whatever. And that was the problem. That's what I didn't want to get into. I want to have somebody that was, had an excellent voice, that could, you know, articulate the feelings and everything else. So it's, so we went through a couple and I'm like, this, it's just not, not going. Immediately when I got Corey's uh, audition, I listened to probably about, I think 10 seconds. And I stopped it and I said, I told my wife, I said, come here, you gotta hear this, you gotta hear this. And so I played the rest of it and it was like, boom, that's it. So I had to write, so I wrote a personal message to all the authors you know, to say, hey, or the narrators and said, I really appreciate it. Great voice, just not, you know, what I was looking for, but, you know, I'll keep you in mind. And because that, as soon as I heard Corey's, that was it. It was done. He was so, your guy. Well, that's guy. awesome. Yeah, that, that, that's every performer and, and entertainer worker's dream is to have somebody go, that's the guy. <laughs> um, so, uh, uh, Corey, uh, same, same question. So, uh, I know that there are a lot of people out there who are interested in getting into uh, audiobook narration or just uh, voiceover in general. And, um, and, and one of the things, it's funny that you mentioned that, that you know, the other uh, people were too polished because uh, I've had the experience with him of, of hearing him be able to, to do that. That, but uh, um, he's very intuitive um, to, to give you a compliment and, and, and probably after reading some of the, the text uh, just knew to, to add that grit, to add that, that level to it. Uh, so do you have anything that you'd like to share with people that might be wanting to get into to voiceover or audiobook narration? Well, uh, the biggest thing I can tell someone is just don't get discouraged because like any form <laughs> of uh, performing, uh, you, you you're gonna get you're gonna get turned down more than you're gonna get offered things, and it it's easy to fall into that. Well, nobody you know nobody likes me. You know I I'm maybe I shouldn't be doing this, and you know just just stick with it, and you're gonna find your spot and you're going to find your niche that that works for you and where your comfort level is and when it comes to you know audiobooks the biggest thing i can tell you is uh go to acx get on there get your profile and then it shows you 
all of the, the different novels that are out there looking for it. And even if you don't submit auditions, download different auditions and for, cause you can filter it for different genres, uh, from fiction to nonfiction, self-help to zombies to, you know, all these uh, different genres that are out there and find what works for you. Um, because for me, as I had mentioned earlier, the, the more you like what you're reading uh, and narrating, the better it's going to sound. Um, the, and the easier it's going to be, you're going to le make less mistakes. Uh, the editing process and mastering process after the fact is going to be a lot easier on you if you're not dreading it. Because I've had a few where it's like, oh, I got to go to the studio. I don't know if I have it in me today for this. Um, and so I, I've kind of gotten really picky about what books I want to do. I have to really believe that I'm going to enjoy it and believe it. And whether it is something that is the, you know, the ultra polished or it's the, or it's the real kind of gritty, raw, just kind of free flowing, whatever it happens to be, I, I just have to passionately want to do it. And if you go about anything you're doing, whether it's voiceover work, uh, narration, anything in there, even podcasts or whatever you happen to be, if you are passionate about it, if it truly drives your soul and feeds your soul, th then just stick with it and, and you're going to love it. But if you don't do anything you don't love, I mean, that's the biggest thing in life I can tell you at yeah. 51 years old is just be passionate and love what you're doing. Stick with it. Corey, when you were narrating the book, uh, literally during a pandemic, <laughs> sitting in that audio closet, uh, were there moments that were chilling for you or where it, like the, the lines were getting blurred a little bit? So there was sort of a war, war of the worlds situation. Yeah, it was not lost on me. The fact that I'm reading about the world falling apart from this virus while the world was actually falling apart from a from a virus and, you know, go from the studio to go to the store and you're walking out with people with, you know, masks on and everything. It's like, OK, this is uh this is eerie, <laughs> you know, the, the, some of the parallels that were, that were happening. Luckily, none of those people with the masks on were trying to eat me. So, <laughs> you know, that was, uh, that was the good part there. <laughs> I, I, will, I, will, I will say my wife, I will say my wife and I actually did talk about it to, to kind of determine whether or not we thought things could be construed as, uh, I don't know, um, you know, um, I want to say, I didn't know if people would take it wrong or if we were trying to make light of the situation or something like that. So my wife and I did talk about it because we did have that little bit of a concern. But at the end of the day, it's like, it's the reader's, you know, job or the readers, you know, they can make whatever they want, make whatever they want out of the story and the book. Either they're going to like it or they don't like it. And at the end of the day, it's up to them. So. Yeah. Well, and the, the wonderful thing about stories is it, it gives us a place to live out some of our uh, passions or fears or whatever those emotions might be. So I would imagine it was probably therapeutic for, for some people to be able to have a place to, to, to put that stuff. Um, is there anything that either of you have been wanting to ask each other? Oh, well, <laughs> I'll let you start with that one, big guy. <laughs> um, so, well, number one, I don't think we've, I don't think we've officially Put it, but I also, but I did did want to ask Corey if he's willing to uh, narrate uh, book number two. Oh, that the series! <laughs> that is a and, huge uh, thumbs up. <laughs> and uh, but uh, yeah, but Corey's been great. I mean, it's not just the guy that goes and records the book and then he just you know throws it out there and says you know there you go. Um, been very supportive with you know, the whole process and even you know marketing and everything else. And um, like I said, we did a, a book trailer. I did a book trailer before. It was just, you know, some music and, you know, some words and stuff. But it wasn't until Corey said, you know, why don't you send me that and let me, uh, let me put a little something on it. And when he narrated during this, this book trailer, it went from like, you know, this to like, you know, boom. And um, so, yeah. And just one more thing. I know when, so we have to review all the audio tapes. And when Corey would send me the, the or the audio files, 
when Corey would send it to me, I'm sitting there listening to him go through the, the words that I, that I wrote. And I'm telling you, the hair on my arms were like standing up. It's one thing to like write it and just kind of read the words. And it's, you know, it is and it's cool and everything. But to hear it, hear it narrated the way he did and, and to bring it to life, it was like, I'm telling you, the, the hair on my arms were standing up. And I'm like, this, this is insane. This thing's going to be this is great. So I, you know, thank Corey again for such a great job. So oh, be thank be you, prepared brother. for a, a chilling experience while reading, while listening to the book. <laughs> if not, if not, there's something wrong with you. I'll put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> I know there, there was, a, there was a couple of times where I had to stop myself and go, oh, damn, that just happened. And I had to walk away and come back and go, all right, now I'm in the right mindset <laughs> uh, to record this next scene. I'm hoping that uh, at the end of this interview that you will play the trailer for the book so that we can uh, uh, not only hear the synopsis of the book, but hear Corey's very uh, articulate, chilling, gritty voice along with it, because uh, I, I played it for my husband this morning and he was like, wow, <laughs> I want to read that. <laughs> so um, uh, it, it definitely is a, a compelling story and um, and especially with Corey's voice behind it, uh, quite, quite a, a substantial piece. Well, it was a, a wonderful process and an exciting process that, in fact, uh, we just found out a few days ago that Amazon and Audible uh, were kind of excited for this to be out to where they're actually pushing it through to get to market uh, quicker than it normally does. So that's, uh, that's a good feeling. So that'll be available, Audible, iTunes, Amazon, any time now. By the time you're watching this, it might already be, you know, available. Yeah. I keep checking; it's not there yet. But they they <laughs> keep telling me they're sending it to uh, send it to market. So um, hopefully here, within, hopefully this week, sometime. Well, and, and for uh, those of you out there that are fans of Gary and uh, who have read the book, uh, who were not aware that you had a podcast, um, would you share the podcast address so that people can go and uh, and listen to more of what you've got? Sure. Um, it's called conformityantidote.com. That's the website, and you can access. Um, we're on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. You can access everything from that point. And um, we're actually, actually, to be honest, we're actually changing the format and of that podcast. And I'm going to go, um, well, we're going to have another podcast, which we do a lot of the goofy stuff. I'm going to have a podcast, which I am going to bring a, uh, a female in, good friend, and we're going to do a lot of just current event news type analysis and stuff and just say where we think things are in the world. So um, more updates on that, and, you know, I'll make sure everybody knows, you know, what the new show is, the new format. So. Perfect. And do either of you have any other shameless plugs? <laughs> well, if... Uh... If you're an author and need narration done, uh, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, but yes, I mean, no, he's, he's call him, hit him up. <laughs> uh, the acx.com, you can uh, you can find me there. But uh, CoreyProductions.com, uh, we have the there's the Light Reapers also Facebook page where we'll be putting updates and doing some contesting with that as well. Nice. Well, and uh, I, I want to just out Corey uh, on one thing real quick. Uh -oh. um, and this is just, again, if you just live locally where, where we do, uh, and that is that uh, he uh, goes uh, during the Christmas season, because not only is he a Christmas junkie, but he also loves zombies, uh, dresses up as zombie claws and will show up at, at, and you can get your picture taken like as if it was uh, Santa Claus and it is like the most fun thing ever. My, my birthday is a, a week before Halloween and this last year he came as Zombie Claus and we set up a little photo booth section and everybody was going and getting their picture taken with Zombie Claus. It's good fun. <laughs> Did not <laughs> know that. <laughs> well, now you're going to have to send him some pictures, Corey. Yeah, yeah definitely. <laughs> Well, it was great talking to both of you. Thank you so much for the interview, and I got to go get to reading. Thank you, Miss Jen. I appreciate it, and uh, just uh, appreciate your work on this, and uh, even setting out some time for, for in your schedule to uh, do this. I really appreciate it. The Light Reapers, End of the World, written by Gary Hickman, narrated by Corey Michaels. 
A virus altered by terrorists was stolen by an ISIS faction with plans to unleash it on the world. The viral weapon turns people into crazed, killing machines who are not satisfied with just killing, but are driven to butcher. The Light Reapers, a special op unit, is deployed to eliminate the ISIS faction and acquire a scientist from the chaos. They are to deliver her along with the virus samples to a fortified CDC facility where she attempts to develop a possible antidote. The Light Reapers must complete this mission while battling the rabid infected through devastated cities and succeed in preventing the end of the world.